Great. So, um, so as uh, David mentioned, I'm uh, a professor at the University of British Columbia, and I'm also lead the environmental risk factors team at the IHME, which uh, puts out the global burden of disease. So, just very briefly, uh, what is the global burden of disease? Um, it is a massive global effort to really systematically quantify health loss. Um, around the world uh, by geography, by age, by sex, to look at trends uh, over time and over space. And importantly for our discussion today, the impact of various risk factors, including environmental pollution, um, on uh, the, that disease burden. What we do uh, every year is actually put out uh, annual um, numbers of disease burden, um, starting from 1990 to the present year. And we're about to also do this for forecasts, uh, also extending to 2100 for again, all of the diseases and the risk factors. Um, importantly, this is using comparable methods, so you're allowed to compare. So it's an apples to apples comparison. And this is done in now 204 different countries and territories around the world. It's a large collaborative effort um, coordinated by IHME involving the World Health Organization and about 5,000 different collaborators. And really pleased that actually a lot of the, the HACAPS uh, members have become collaborators in the project um, by providing their own uh, scientific uh, expertise. So what we've learned from the global burden of disease uh, from this comparative aspect is air pollution is, is a major risk factor for global health. So, so the number of deaths that we attribute to air pollution, we can now put it in context of other well-known and well-appreciated risk factors for health, such as smoking, such as high body mass index, such as alcohol use, uh, for example. And what we learned from that is air pollution ranks very, very highly. It accounts for um, ambient particulate matter, accounts for 7% of all deaths. But when we look at all forms of air pollution, uh, particulate matter, household air pollution from the use of solid fuels for cooking and ozone, that accounts for about 12% of all deaths. And just to put that in context, um, tobacco smoking is uh, uh, accounts for about 15% of all deaths. Dietary factors, about 14%. So it's really right up there with some things that I think everybody would appreciate as being important uh, for health. Um, this has high costs. Um, so some work uh, that was done together with the World Bank several years ago, the estimated uh, welfare costs due to, due to health impacts were $5 trillion per year uh, and an additional $225 billion per year in lost labor income. Um, so really massive impacts on health and, and uh, economic impact. Um, satellite inputs have been absolutely critical to our estimates for the global burden of disease. We have uh, ground monitoring data for many countries in the world, and this is increasing. Um, but there are huge gaps, even in high-income countries with excellent monitoring networks, such as the U.S. Uh, or increasingly China, where we have lots of ground monitoring. We still have gaps in space and time, and satellite-derived uh, information really fills in those gaps. And then many other parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but also uh, the Middle East, um, Central Asia, uh, where we have a, a very, very little ground monitoring, satellite information is absolutely essential. And so this has really been a scientific advance uh, to the point where we're not only using satellite-based estimates for these sort of impact assessments, we're actually using them now directly in epidemiologic studies uh, to actually improve our understanding of the impact of air pollution and health and really see uh, no difference um, in the use in terms of accuracy, in terms of use of satellite-based estimates or the more traditional ground monitoring approach. Um, as I just mentioned uh, in, in the video, um, we're really pleased to collaborate with uh, Jason West's team uh, and develop really an enhanced set of global ozone estimates um, for this most recent round of the global burden of disease. And uh, we see here just one, one example for, for one year. This is for 2019 estimates of, of ozone exposure around the world. 
And again, uh, link that with uh, impact on disease burden and, and more than 350,000 deaths uh, per year attributable to ozone pollution. And this is also very important in, in terms of our forecast when we start, start to look at, at a warmer climate, um, ozone is likely to have greater impacts uh, in, into the future. Um, we've also worked uh, now for this next cycle uh, very closely actually with Susan Annenberg's team and, and others to uh, use a, additional uh, estimates of air pollution, including nitrogen dioxide, again, uh, heavily relying on remote sensing information um, to provide another uh, bit of information about air pollution, which we really don't capture with ozone or particulate matter, which is sort of city level air pollution, primarily due to transportation. And this is nitrogen dioxide. Um, and we're looking at the, the impact of nitrogen dioxide on childhood asthma, especially in terms of the disease burden uh, impact. So just um, to wrap up, um, what is the impact of the, the GBD been in terms of air pollution globally? And while we certainly can't take all the credit, there are many other things that, that have happened. Um, the, the estimates that we produced were actually very influential early on in, in China. Um, in, in sort of a shift from the government from downplaying the problem to addressing it, it head on and putting in new re regulations, we're actually seeing the benefit uh, of, of today. And the same kind of thing is going on now in Italy, in, sorry, in India, where um, estimates from the global burden disease have, have really put air pollution uh, high on the map in terms of the health problem. Uh, in India, as you can see by this analysis that was done together with a large group of collaborators in India, um, air pollution and again all its forms, household air pollution and particulate matter pollution and ozone, is responsible for a larger burden of disease than tobacco smoking uh, in in India, and and really this has put air pollution on the health agenda um, in one of the most polluted and largest uh, countries in in the world. Um, these estimates are also used by many others, uh, OECD, World Bank, I mentioned, Environmental Performance Index, the Lancet Countdown, and uh, again, provides that sort of global context in terms of where does their pollution rank uh, relative uh, to other things. Um, and just to close, moving forward, um, we see a huge uh, use of satellite-based information as we expand to look at other environmental risk factors. And actually, and just looking at disease more generally, for example, uh, gridded population data, we can use uh, satellite imagery to better estimate fine scale population distributions. How do we disaggregate census information into uh, smaller, uh, more fine uh, resolution, uh, et cetera. So, Really pleased to um, be working with ACAS, be working with NASA, um, and it's really critical uh, to the work uh, that we do to use satellite-based information, remote sensing information. So thank you, and I will stop there. Great, thank you, Mike. Our next presentation and introduction will be from Jason West from the University of North Carolina Chapel. Great, thank you. That was a really excellent presentation and motivating for a lot of what we do, Mike, so thanks for that. I wanna share my screen. I'll just take a few minutes here and follow up with what Mike Brower just talked with you about and uh, talk a bit about the work that we did at UNC to support the global burden of disease with our global ozone uh, indicator um, uh, work, and then I'll pose a few broader questions about where the field is going in the future. Um, our first uh, look at this was in support of uh, GBD 2017, and this was work led by Kailan Chang. Um, we took the TOR, the Tropospheric Ozone Assessment Report, and CCMI models. So we used here, I think, if I remember, it's seven different uh, global computer models that simulated global ozone. And we did a statistical data fusion to merge these together. This was then used in uh, the global burden of disease assessment to estimate then 470,000 premature deaths from exposure to ozone globally. Um, in, we then continued that work in the work that um, Michael was just talking about by making some improvements for GBD 2019. 
Here we created yearly output for each year between 1990 and 2017. We added additional models, so now we have nine models. We also used additional observations, and in particular, we used the uh, Chinese observations. Going forward, I know, I know that there's now a new network in India, for example, that we can fold into this. But one of the things I want to point out here is the scarcity of observations in many places of the world that remains an important problem that limits um, our confidence in, uh, in what we're doing. Uh, and I'll come back to that theme later. We use the um, uh, Bayesian maximum entropy data diffusion method that uh, smoothly weights observations and uh, models through time and through space. Um, and we used a NASA fine resolution model to impose a fine resolution structure, especially we were concerned about getting an urban pattern correctly because a lot of people live there. Um, so we imposed that pattern on uh, and produced output at 0.1 degree resolution. We're really hopeful that this will be a resource useful for the community of atmospheric scientists, health effects researchers, epidemiologists, but our, our immediate goal was to provide it to GBD. These are some of the results that we came up with. Using our methods, we basically matched the observation at monitoring stations. The influence of that observation drops off in space and time according to its space-time covariance. And away from observations, we're gonna to tend toward what the models are giving us, the models once they are bias corrected. Uh, those are what our methods provide. And the, the figure here shows region by region of the world looking at trends over this 28-year uh, period. Um, and you can see that um, some places are going down in ozone, like North America, but the global picture is that, by and large, people are breathing more polluted air through time, and that's really driven by upward trends in very polluted regions in East Asia, South Asia, including India, Africa as well is, is trending up, it, it appears. Okay. Um, Mike said some great things to put the numbers into perspective. Uh, this is not just for ozone, but um, if we add ozone and PM 2.5 together, this is one way that I've come to like to uh, communicate the importance of air pollution for um, premature death and for health in general by comparing against other causes of death. So the GBD 2017 results had 109,000 deaths per year in the United States. Our work suggests the number might be about half of that. Um, if it's 109,000, that's one of every 25 deaths in the United States. And you can look down the list here. We don't know the PM number well, but um, these are things that most people, I think, would expect to be a greater influence on health than, than air pollution would be. So I've come to talk about um, air pollution as being as important as uh, all transportation accidents plus all gun shootings in the United States or we could say uh, prostate cancer plus breast cancer. Okay. Um, I'll end with a, a couple of slides just to provoke discussion. Uh, and I thought of this paper by Randall Martin. Mike Brower also contributed to it, but no one knows which city has the highest concentration of fine particulate matter. And Randall and colleagues had put this forward as a way of sort of talking about um, the maturity of our field or the immaturity of our field, that we've got a long way to go, that if we can't answer because of a lack of measurements, uh, if we can't provide a definitive answer to a question like this, we, we probably have some more work to do. And when I showed the ozone map before, that same map also holds for fine PM and other pollutants, that we have a lot of good measurements in Europe and um, the United States, uh, Japan, South Korea, growing into now China, now uh, growing in India as well. But that leaves a lot of areas of the world that really have a, a lack of measurements. And we need uh, to be thinking about how do we go about addressing this. And so one we, way we could do this is um, we had done uh, data fusion. That was the theme of the um, work that I just shared with you. But if we take ground monitors, models, low cost sensors, which might be biased, but nonetheless provide information. And in a data fusion kind of framework, you could provide that information with a large uncertainty around it. Um, and then satellites, of course. And could we 
you know, this is now being done at a research scale for particular applications. Could we be doing it? I think it's a challenge to think about how do we operationalize this more? So it's not it, looking into the future. It may not be necessarily um, researchers that are doing this, but uh, air quality agency that stitches this information together every day and provides a product that people can use, whether that's a forecast product or a retrospective project. And then what I think is one of the other big challenges going forward, how do we provide information beyond, you know, this would get at um, what is the air that people are breathing to understanding what are the sources of that air pollution and what would the um, benefits of different management actions be for um, air quality and human health. I know Davin um, has worked in this area and they're uh, uh, doing as well as anybody at doing this on a global scale. But it's a big challenge about, you know, we've got many urban areas around the world. Each urban area, there will be commonalities among them, but certainly differences as well, that um, there will be a different mix of sources that are relevant. So how do we best use models, use these kind of tools? Um, and, and a model sort of has to be involved because we're asking what if questions if emissions were to change. Um, so I'll leave it there, and maybe Devin wants to pick up on some of those themes, but thank you. Thanks, Jason. And I'll share a couple of slides, and as Jason said, uh, pick up on, on the topics that he was mentioning. Um, you know, in terms of using satellite data uh, for health impact studies, you know, the benefit that sort of mentioned in the um, description of this panel is the global scope of that. And I, I wanted to begin with one sort of historical point of reference for the impact of this. And that's kind of going back to the first global burden of disease estimates uh, that came out from, uh, you know, the Cohen paper in 2004 that were based on PM monitoring in cities estimating a global burden uh, of long-term uh, of premature mortality, you know, long-term exposure to PM 2.5 of less than a million. But then, you know, a decade later, we have the first estimate based on remote sensing and the expanded picture that we get from space in terms of the sheer number of people exposed to this um, pollutant really increased the magnitude of that number. And uh, as Mike Brower mentioned that, you know, now we think that number is actually much higher, but um, Still, this difference between 0.8 and 2.4 was largely driven by the availability of this remote sensing data to quantify exposure across a, a much wider range of the population. Um, we talk about these satellite-based estimates, and, and this really kind of follows up on what Jason was talking about. There's different levels of, of the way we use remote sensing and different data products to get at exposure uh, on these scales. Um, I think for things like NO2 and formaldehyde, we still need to use some sort of model or proxy data. Sometimes it's a statistical regression, but typically in these kind of global scale studies, it is a global atmospheric model that relates the column concentration of the observed species to the nose level, uh, as Brian would say, uh, nose level concentration. Um, for, for estimating PM2.5, we have these satellite-based or satellite-derived PM2.5 estimates. This is an even more complicated science and involved science it involves additional data sets beyond the satellite itself, using geostatistical information, information from models relating aerosolical depth that the satellite actually measures to surface PM2.5. And then lastly, for ozone, Jason presented a lot of this data fusion work. Um, within the global burden of disease, you know, this has, again, progressed quite a bit in the last decade. I think some of the first global estimates of ozone uh, global burden of disease come from Jason's group and, and Susan Annenberg was in his group at that time, you know, using one model. And now this has progressed to many models used with in situ measurements. Um, but it's still something that that uh, hasn't brought in the satellite data. So I think that's an important thing to mention within the context of Haycast that the challenge in using satellite data for that is that you know, we don't have the direct satellite observations of the surface of ozone. So there's indirect ways of getting at that um, that are, that are um, I think, quite extensive in terms of, of research uh, projects. And that's uh, one method is to use chemical data assimilation to constrain, uh, to assimilate observations like NO2 and formaldehyde and use this to estimate ozone. And so some of the HACAST activities were down uh, this sort of avenue of research. Uh, we did some of this in my work. 
Jessica New and the JPL team has done a lot of this as well. Uh, I think you'll be hearing more about that. So that, you know, just kind of brings up um, the, the importance of not just satellite data alone, but satellite data fused with these other sorts of information and tools like models. Models provide a means of then us being able to attribute global burdens that we see from space to emissions from different sectors, different activities, anthropogenic or natural sources, or emissions from particular countries or regions. I'll just uh, highlight some of the work that we did uh, uh, using the combination of models and satellites uh, that came out through HACAST. And one of these was using the satellite based estimate of exposure to PM2.5 um, in, a, in a, um, a global survey of the impact of PM2.5 on preterm births, um, finding that out of 15 million premature births, about two to four of those were associated with exposure to the anthropogenic PM2.5. And the way the modeling came into this framework is, is to be able to say anthropogenic. Are we, we're then using the model to apportion this total PM2.5 that we, that we see or derive from the satellite to the fraction that's natural versus the fraction controlled by human emissions. In work led by Susan Annenberg, um, this is an example getting to something that's even more specific. This is looking at uh, the exposure to PM2.5 and associated health impacts in terms of premature deaths, but then the fraction of that associated with emissions of uh, NOx from diesel sources, in particular the, the amount of diesel that was in excess of diesel regulations, and showing what that looked like in 2015, and then using a model to project how that could change in 2040 uh, under the adoption of more uh, stringent vehicle emission standards. And so again, here we're seeing this combination of using the satellite to assess the burden and the models to kind of trace things back to emissions. And lastly, again, I'll, I'll end on this point, which I think is a, a challenge that's still kind of on the table, um, a challenge possibly for the next HACAST. And uh, it, I, this was not my HACAST proposal, so I'm not making a pitch for myself here, uh, but I, I think it is an important challenge that you know, there are ways that we can get remote sensing data into these global burden disease assessments uh, of ozone. Um, and, and some work that we did, I think, in that direction that we didn't, you know, really get all the way. But in our group, we were assimilating NO2 observations from OMI using retrievals from NASA and from Domino and using that to constrain NOx emissions. And then these NOx emissions are using are used to drive a model that uh, we can evaluate ozone trends and we can evaluate whether that was an improvement in the ozone, or we can add that to the ensemble of, of I think, data streams that, that work that you know, Jason and others are doing to, to uh, you know, come up with our kind of best estimate of ozone exposure. So that's uh, something that I, I think is promising. And I'd, like to see, I'd like to see more of that in the future. So with that, um, I will stop sharing and and now we'll introduce the last panel member, uh, Jeremy Hess, who you saw in the videos already um, from University of Washington. Thanks, Davin. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn with uh, my remarks. I didn't prepare any slides because I wanted to uh, basically reflect on uh, some of what's been presented and our work um, as part of HACAST. Um, our core project focused on pollen. It focused on uh, assessing the potential for remote sensing to facilitate uh, modeling of pollen in data sparse locations and uh, we focused in particular on the continental U.S. and did a large updated descriptive analysis of the pollen data that are available, and then embarked on several different modeling adventures, uh, seeing where we could plug uh, observational gaps using, uh, using web searches for different terms, uh, see if that could serve as a proxy. Uh, looking at a whole host of different uh, epidemiological associations between pollen exposure uh, for uh, different types of allergenic pollens and uh, different adverse health outcomes, and then developed a new machine learning tool to uh, estimate speciated pollen counts for the U.S. 
uh, with the goal of generating uh, graded exposure estimates for uh, the contiguous United States, um, which we're hoping to put out later this year. Our work was uh, different than most of what the rest of the HACAST members were focused on. And I heard several times at, at our meetings that their impression of uh, the work when I reported out on it was that we were at the place that air pollution was at perhaps two decades ago or even longer. Um, and Davin's remarks on the trajectory of that field resonate for me, um, that we continue to make good progress, but we were much further behind the rest of the group uh, in terms of um, sussing out all of uh, these challenges in terms of globalizing our exposure estimates and disease burden estimates. Uh, but I worked with this group on the Exposure Tiger team, and through that, it facilitated some connections with the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, which is an annual uh, collection of uh, analyses uh, related to various indicators on climate change and health. And I uh, worked with Yan Lu to uh, develop and integrate wildfire hotspot estimates from HACAST, uh, for, excuse me, from remotely sensed data into the countdown. Um, and explored possible inclusion of pollen into the countdown and will burden of disease. And we're not at the place yet where we can do any kind of global exposure estimation. So it's not really ready for those applications, but still learned a tremendous amount. And uh, over the course of this work, there were three things that I wanted to reflect back to the group. Um, the first one is that people really love to see themselves in these visualizations and these data, which sounds a bit like a truism, but uh, it's been a consistent experience for me whenever I present this work and present the remotely sensed images, present the pollen calendars, people come up and they start immediately trying to locate themselves and their experience and their illnesses and the history and the illnesses of their family members and others uh, into those uh, visualizations. And it's a powerful tool uh, to be able to uh, connect people with a narrative of their own experience around these exposures and these impacts. Another uh, take home that I found uh, with this HACAS project is that convening power is very important, that NASA has a lot of convening power. IHME and the Global Burden of Disease have a lot of convening power, and the Lancet has a lot of convening power. And when you bring those groups together, uh, that power is amplified even further. And this is uh, important because I think HACAST has it right. HACAST has framed uh, its research as a collaboration. And when it frames uh, research in that way and supports research in, uh, in a collaborative fashion, people flock to it and it works well. And you see really rapid progress in areas that you might not otherwise see quite uh, the same progress moving forward. And so uh, I applaud that and I'm grateful to have been a part of it and want to highlight that the model is one that, that of course, it's been refined over several iterations, but it works well and I hope it continues. Uh, my last um, take home is that remotely sensed data are only part of the equation. And you've certainly heard that from uh, the other presenters today. It's very much the case with pollen. We've been quite uh, limited by what we can do uh, because we don't have ground observations that are reliable for pollen. Uh, they exist for uh, some parts of the world outside the United States. We don't have access to them. And because there was not quite the same convening function uh, around pollen in this work, uh, we weren't able to get access to that data. And um, just like with uh, other types of air pollution, there's potential for advancing work on pollen uh, by focusing on low cost sensors and uh, remote sensing of different vegetation indices and other uh, strategies. And that's important. Um, but this work is a mosaic. There's central funding for the synthesis uh, in these global reports in the GBD and the Lancet Countdown, et cetera. But the funding for the exposure science is typically separate. And that's, a, um, I think, an important thing for people to keep in mind that this funding 
and this work is uh, a happy, I wouldn't say it's a happy accident, but uh, it's possible because there's intentional parallel funding uh, of different groups across different uh, activities. And if any of that falters, the work will lose its momentum and its progress. And I think that's important to uh, keep in mind. So I'm grateful to NASA for the opportunity to be involved. I'm grateful to my colleagues who have done all of this work. And I look forward to uh, the time when work on pollen reaches the same level that uh, has been described here in terms of the other air pollutants. Thanks.